Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks for jumping in. Thanks for joining me. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Type in the comments where you're checking in from so we know. Good morning. Hey there, Susie. Good morning, everybody. Let me get past this yard. This dog typically is not very loud, but I guess he's a little hyped up today. I don't know. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, guys. All right. What's up, Jeremiah? What's up, everybody? Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, just in case you are new to my ministry, maybe you're a recent follower, just now following my account. Thanks so much. My name's Matt, Matt McMillan, clearly. I'm a Christian author. I have written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback, Kindle, as well as hardcover. So be sure to check them out if something that I'm saying is interesting to you. I've written a lot of books and I think I can help you understand who you are and who Christ is and who you are together. If you have read any of my books, I would also appreciate a review if you would go back to Amazon, Barnes and Noble's website, Goodreads, wherever you purchased it from, and leave me a quick review. I also have a podcast. This is my podcast I'm recording live on Instagram, and you can listen to all of my past Walk Talks on my podcast. Just search Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. It's available on every major podcast platform. Now, if you are listening on the podcast, please pause the podcast, leave me a quick review, and then come on back and finish, finish listening. Also, if you're listening on the podcast, when you pause the podcast, there's a link in the show notes where you can sign up for my free daily devotional. If you're not listening on the podcast, you can actually go to my website, mattmcmillan.com, go to the free newsletter tab, I'll send you a free devotional early every morning. I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. The word pastor is only used once in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4, we see no list of qualifications, no list of authority. So we are giving people authority who, according to the Bible, have no authority. They also have no qualifications. And we practice this because of man-made tradition all right so i always try to get that out in the beginning when you first start following my account you think i'm a pastor at a church i'm not <laughs> i'm a member of the ecclesia just like you if you have trusted in jesus and we are equals now if you want to contact me please do not message me on social media i don't keep up with those i will be glad to interact with you just go to my website go over to the contact page and i'll be glad to talk to you there. Now I'm getting ready to do the cue for the beginning of my walk talk. I just did my introduction. If you're new to my ministry, I get that out of the way. And then if you are listening in the future, you want to skip through my introduction. This is what you need to listen for. Now here it is. <laughs> Let's get to today's walk talk. So that's the cue. I'm getting ready to start. If you want to skip ahead in the future, because over time, you're gonna be able to mouth my introduction. And a lot of people say, why do you do your introduction every time? Because there's always somebody new listening, and this just saves me a lot of back and forth in my inbox. All right, so today's Walk Talk, 10 Lies About the Rapture. So this is actually gonna be a two-part series. I'm gonna do five today, and then I'm gonna do another five next week. I've already got all 10 planned out, and I had a lot more than 10, but I broke them down, combined them, and I think I can help you guys out. Now, here are the five from today. If you're also new to my ministry, I will typically do bullet points. Just makes things nice and neat and even. Not always, but quite often I do. So here are the five lies about the rapture. I'm going to tell you what the five are. going to do a little overview stuff, then we're going to dive in deep to all five. Okay, so number one, the first lie. Hey, good morning, Amber. The first lie about the rapture. Number one, the Bible is clear. Jesus will take one and leave the other during the rapture. So that's number one. The Bible is clear. Jesus will take one and leave the other during the rapture. Okay. 
<laughs> Give me some time, okay? If you're just tuning in, you're like, oh no, McMillan, you're wrong. Just hang on. Let me get to it. I'm going to get into it, okay? All right, number two, the second lie about the rapture. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 say Jesus will take some and leave others. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says Jesus will take some and leave others. They're left. It says left right here. What does it say, McMillan? <laughs> Is left there? Oh, I got you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that today. All right, number three, the third lie about the rapture. And the wind is picking up today. I think it might end up raining. We'll see if it holds off. Um, I got this little hand towel at the bottom of the phone as a wind muff. So hopefully it's doing a good job. If not, I apologize. I can't do nothing about the wind. <laughs> Um, okay, so the third lie about the rapture. The tribulation years will begin after the rapture or before the rapture. Number three, the third lie, the tribulation years, the years of the tribulation will begin after the, rep, after the rapture or before the rapture. Okay, so that's number three. The years of the tribulation will begin after the rapture or before the rapture. Okay, number four, Daniel prophesied about the rapture and Jacob's trouble from Jeremiah 30 is also referring to the rapture. Okay, so this is number four, Daniel prophesied about the rapture and Jacob's trouble from Jeremiah 30 is also referring to the rapture. Okay, and then number five, the fifth lie about the rapture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is clear there's a rapture. Okay, number five, I'm going to repeat it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is clear. It's clear. <laughs> What's it say? <laughs> that there's a rapture. Okay, so let's talk about those today. And then I'm not going to go over the next five. I already know what the next five are, but you'll have to tune in next time. <laughs> For part two of 10 Lies About the Rapture, this is going to be the first five. Okay, so before I dive into the first five, let's do a little bit of overview stuff quickly because this is going to help out as I explain things. So, first of all, I did a full walk talk on the rapture, my last walk talk, episode 251. It's called Understanding the Rapture and the Dead in Christ Shall Rise First. So, that was a very, very in-depth walk talk. So be sure to go back and listen to that. I'm not going to cover all that again today, but you're probably going to need to listen to that, watch that in order to understand this even better. But I'm going to try to give you the Cliff's Notes on that walk talk, okay? Um, so when we get into talking about the rapture, first of all, let me say this from the beginning. I love you. This is not to sweep the legs out from under your belief system. When I do these walk talks, it is never to be combative. It is never to stir up trouble. It's never even to trigger the algorithms, even though this is a very triggering algorithm -y topic. And here's my goal. This is my goal when I talk about anything eschatology, anything in times. It is to bring you peace. I want you to be able to exhale. I want you to enjoy the peace and freedom that Christ came to give you. That's why I'm talking about this. And over the years, I've dabbled in it. It's not the focus of what I want to talk about. But we get asked about this all the time in the New Covenant community. And I've got New Covenant friends who are in here today watching me live. And... We want to talk about Jesus. <laughs> we want to talk about who you are, what you want, all of that good stuff that comes with the new, the new covenant truths. But we get lots of questions about the end of time, eschatology, everything that has to do with what happens when Christ returns. So we have to talk about it. And when we talk about it, those of us in the new covenant community, we are not afraid. And when I say new covenant community, community, I'm talking about those of us who understand what Christ has done for us. Forgive us. What Christ has done to us. 
cause us to become a new creation and what Christ wants to do through us. So we're not afraid. We're not afraid. We have nothing to be afraid of. But there's a lot of people who are afraid. And here's why they're afraid. They're afraid because of what's called proof texting. Here's what's proof texting. Proof texting is copy pasting scripture. So let's back up before I talk about proof texting because this is going to help you out a lot. When the Bible was canonized, all 66 books were put together, 40 different authors. They did not put chapters. There were no chapters in the Bibles. Chapters were added in the 13th century, only for easy referencing, not for context. Also, subheadings were not in the Bible. What's a subheading? A subheading is a section above a chapter trying to tell you what that chapter is about. The subheadings were added by the publishers so you can get an overview of what the text is. But the problem with that is that's not always accurate. But people go to the subheadings and they look at the subheadings as actual scripture. So you got chapters added, subheadings, which have, it's not always the correct context because the chapters weren't always put that number in place based on the context. So when you're trying to build context on a chapter and you have to read the whole letter or three chapters before that, two chapters after that, you're gonna struggle. But not only that, in the 16th century, verses were added to the Bible for no particular rhyme or reason or context except for easier referencing. So you got chapters added in the 13th century, you got subheadings added by the publisher, and then you also have verses. Now the verses, some of those verses are even in between sentences. Think about that. The Bible was not ri- written in chapters, verse, or subheadings. But here's what happened. In the 16th century, a group of people called the Protestant scholastics started doing what's called proof texting. Proof texting is taking a chapter or two chapters or parts of a chapter from one letter, going over into another letter, which has no context whatsoever about this other part but they still take that other section with that chapter, those sets of verses, and they put them together or they refer to each other as in they are in the same context when they're not. So proof texting is demonic. Proof texting is copy pasting scripture to build a theology. Here it is. That does not stand on what Christ accomplished. The devil proof texted Matthew chapter four in the wilderness, tempted Jesus to jump from a high cliff or up on a building, wherever he was. Your angels will catch you. Proof texting, proof texting takes the context of scripture, throws it out the window and ignores the goodness of God, ignores what Christ accomplished, ignores everything that Jesus has done. So when proof texting began with the Protestant scholastics, there was another group called the Plymouth Brethren shortly after that. Now there was a man by the name of John Darby. Now we don't want to blame everything on John Darby, but John Darby created this theology through proof texting of taking 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Matthew 24, Luke 21, 1 John, 2 John, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, got to go over into Revelation, stick them all together, boom, the rapture. You're going to be left behind. You better endure to the end. You better, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord. <laughs> so you have all these passages taken out of context. You have Bible verses describing unbelievers to believers. You got people thinking that they have to do something to endure. Even me saying this, you're like, well, you do, (laughs) but you don't, you don't have the ability to endure. What will you do? Sin less? That's not good enough. 
do more good things, that's not good enough. It is Christ who endured, not you. So the enduring passages, we're going to talk about that in number one today. So my goal today is to point out the proof texting, refocus on what Christ accomplished, and ease your mind. Because Hebrews chapter 2 says, everybody who has been afraid of death all their life, Christ has set them free from the fear of death. So if we can be set free from the fear of death. We should also be set free of Christ's return. Fear, fear of Christ's return. Why would you need to be afraid when Christ returns? Why? Sinning? <laughs> what did he do at the cross with those sins? Not doing enough good things? Well, Isaiah 64, 6 says, Your best works are like filthy rags. Hebrews chapter 9 says Jesus will return without reference to sin. So we don't have to be afraid of death if we've believed. We don't have to be afraid of his return if we're still alive when he comes back. But the box church pushes proof texting, continues it with the tradition of men, ignores all of the surrounding context, takes stuff and just mixes it all together and creates fear. And John said, perfect love casts out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. So if I'm afraid that Jesus is returning, I would be afraid of being punished. But what would I be punished for? Sins. Every sin I commit. But what happened to Jesus? He was punished. So if Jesus was punished, I'm not going to be punished. So when I say something that clearly is not of God, or I do something that clearly is not of God, that is a sin. Jesus paid for it. So this is the grace of God, which helps you to mature out of that. Because you don't confuse what you just did or what you just said with who you are. Because that's not you. And then you can repent quicker. You can say, well, clearly that was incorrect. So... Strengthen me, Lord. Help me not to do that again. Help me not to say that again. We don't have to say, oh, you're going to be punished. No, Jesus was punished. So, don't be afraid of the end of time. Don't be afraid of Christ's return. That's the point of this walk talk, okay? All right, so let's get into number one, the first lie about the rapture. Number one. Out of 10. <laughs> Going to do five today and then the next five next week. Okay. The Bible is clear. When Jesus returns, he will take one and leave the other. That's the rapture. Okay. So the only way we can come up with this theology is if we proof text 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. And then you go over and you proof text it with Matthew 24, Luke 21. And then parts of Luke 17 and Mark 13. That's the only way you could come up with this because where it says one will be left, one will be taken. That's over in Matthew 24, Luke 21, same context. So in that section of scripture, does it say that Jesus takes anybody? No, Jesus does not say I will take somebody. He does not say the son of man will take somebody. None of that. It simply says one will be taken, one will be left. Now, due to proof texting, people will immediately go to Matthew 24. They'll pick this verse and then the next verse. They'll say, what do you have to say? It says one will be taken, one will be left. Yes, it does not say Jesus will take them. So if it doesn't say Jesus is going to take them, what's the context? You have to pan back. You got to pan all the way back. You have to read all around it, get all the surrounding context. Here's the context. Armies surrounding and invading Jerusalem. Jesus is giving a future prophecy about Rome's invasion, which would happen in the year AD 70. This is why he said, when the armies are surrounding Jeru Jerusalem, Head for the mountains. Don't go to the city. 
Two will be working in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Who took the one? The army. Why didn't they take the other one? I don't know. Maybe they ran. Maybe that particular soldier had mercy. I don't know. But one taken, one left. This has nothing to do with one person sinning less, one person sinning more. None of that. Also, the law was still in effect when he was saying this. Two women working at the... Two men, women grinding at the mill. One taken, one left. It does not say Jesus takes the person out of the field. It does not say Jesus takes the woman at the mill. One will be sleeping, or two will be sleeping. One taken, one left. It does not say Jesus takes them. Please read all of it. All around it. Don't superimpose what you've been taught. Now, John Darby made this the rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible. The word rapture is not in any of the Gospels. It's not in Mark 13, Luke 17, Mark 24, Luke, 7, Luke 21. It's not there. It says nothing about a rapture. You would have to go over into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Excuse me, verse 17. We see the word harpazo over there. We're going to get into that. Harpazo means to be caught up. Catch. Another, this is where we get the, the, uh, the name for it. harpoon. You, you, you stab something and you pull it. You're going to be pulled up into the air. If you're still alive, when Jesus returns, we're going to get into that. But over here in Matthew 24, Luke 21 says nothing about Jesus taking one and leaving the other. Nothing. So let's touch. And I talked about this in great detail last walk talk. So be sure to listen to that. I can't go over all that today, but let's just touch on a few of these because you have been taught this, uh, not just that part, but other parts of it in a, an erroneous way based on proof texting and tradition of men. Both Jesus and Paul warned against the tradition of men, but yet we preach tradition of men while ignoring the surrounding context. For example, it will be a very troubling time for pregnant or nursing women. Why? Because you're going to be taken from your baby. Your baby's going to be taken from you. The abomination of desolation. What is that? Now, those who proof text, they'll go over into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, pull out the word lawless one in the temple. Then they'll go over into 1 John and 2 John, take the word antichrist, say the lawless one is the antichrist. And I've done walk talks on this, so be sure to check it out. Let's say the lawless one is the antichrist. They set up in the temple. This is the abomination of desolation. Proof texting. <laughs> Proof texting galore. The abomination is Rome infiltrating the temple. It would be an absolute abomination if these Gentile government leaders went into the temple and put their flag up. Not only did, not only did they not do that, not only did they do that, but they also destroyed that temple. So you had the first temple, which was built by Solomon which was destroyed by the Babylonians. First temple, second temple, was the temple during Jesus' time. It would be an absolute abomination if the Roman government went into the sanctuary, which means holy place, God's seat on earth. That's the abomination. And they destroyed that temple, therefore destroying that Jewish sacrificial system as well this is why they want the third temple to be built you hear that you got the 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 heifers over in jerusalem this is a sign and i've done a walk talk on the red heifers so be sure to check that out but they need the third temple built because they have no way to receive forgiveness because the jews only receive forgiveness annually at the temple the temple's gone so they need that but there's no sacrifice remaining at the temple for sins. Jesus was the final sacrifice. They refuse to believe that, so they stick notes in an old wall of Jerusalem, begging God to hurry up and send the right Messiah and to build another temple. They refuse to believe in this once for all sacrifice of Jesus. But it was destroyed. So what about the sun, moon, and stars going dark. Many people say, oh no, this is the end of time. Sun, moon, stars going dark. This is a euphemism for the sky is falling. The Jews knew exactly what the authors were referring to. 
The Jews knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. The sun, moon, and stars is referred to in Isaiah 13 and Ezekiel 32. In Isaiah 13, it is referring to the downfall of Babylon. In Ezekiel 32, it is referring to the downfall of Pharaoh. So he is saying the downfall of your system is about to happen. The abomination of desolation, sun, moon, stars will go dark. And many people say, oh no, he says, when you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Well, you see that as in Jesus coming to us. That's how you see it. So when you hear the words, the Son of Man coming in the clouds, you think fear. And the reason why you think fear is because of traditional teaching. But if there's a coming, there's a going. So if he's coming in the clouds, he even said this will happen in your generation. What would be that generation? The first century. So if he's coming in the clouds, he is coming to heaven, going from earth. He even said, I will go to the Father. So when you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, when did that happen? Acts chapter 1. But we use this as Jesus is going to come in the clouds. He's going to take you and leave you, take you, leave you. you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. And then they got to go over into Matthew 7. Proof text that when Jesus is talking about people who are looking to the law for righteousness. Or they'll go over into Revelation. You're lukewarm. You're not saying Lord, Lord. Or you're saying Lord, Lord. You're going to be left. Proof texting there's nothing to be afraid of when you read all of these in context and when you read all of it based on what Christ accomplished at the cross, which is choose to remember your sins no more. 2 Corinthians 5.19, he no longer holds your sins against you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he became sin so you could become righteous. It was a trade-off. And you access this by grace through faith, not through what you do and what you don't do. All right, let's go on to number two, the second lie about the rapture. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 say Jesus will leave people left on earth. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 say Jesus will leave people left on earth. It does not say that. <laughs> you don't have to be afraid of that. Here's what it says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, right there, before I go on to verse 17, the dead in Christ rising first are referenced in verse 13, 14, and 15. So if you only go to verse 16 and you proof text that, you could come up with the theology that there's going to be dead people coming out of the graves. Now, did that happen in the Gospels? Yes. Completely different context. And we see Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, <laughs> coming out of his tomb. That's not the context of this over here. The dead in Christ shall rise first are those who have already died, already what Paul calls fallen asleep. Asleep is another word for died. So you've got the dead in Christ shall rise first are those who have already died. He says, because they believed, he says, you guys have a hope. So he's saying, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a shout. There's going to be a voice. There's going to be a trumpet. The dead in Christ are going to return with him in the clouds. This is why if we continue on verse 17, and he says, now get this, here it is. Those, are, those of us who are still alive and are left. I'm going to repeat that part. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Those who are alive and are left. This doesn't say anything about left behind. This doesn't say anything about Jesus leaving people and taking others. It just says, those who are still alive and are left. That means you're still alive. If I am still alive, I'm still left here. I haven't fallen asleep, AKA physically died. 
those who are alive and are left will be caught up. There it is, harpazo. Now, if you want to say rapture, I honestly, I don't care if you use the word rapture there. It makes no difference to me. But it's not what the Plymouth Brethren and John Darby came up with. <laughs> Darby even has his own Bible, the Darby Bible. This rapture theology began before Darby, shortly before Darby, but he took proof texting and just <laughs> went off with it, creating a fear-based eschatology. You better be careful. You better stop sinning. You better do good stuff. Who thought that? The Jews. They thought they were sinning less than others. They called everybody a sinner. Thought they were doing more good stuff. They were giving out of their abundance. Didn't bother them at all. We do the same thing today. When we say Jesus is going to come back, if you're not busy, you're not ready. Are you rapture ready? <laughs> you're going to be left behind. One taken, one left. First Corinthians or First Thessalonians 4.17. But let's continue this. Actually, let's, let's go back up to verse 16 and we're going to read this all together because this is going to make a lot more sense. And the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and are left will be caught up with them. Who's, who's the them? The saints, your loved ones. They're going to be coming back. You're going to be, if, if I am alive and I have not died, I will be caught up, float in the clouds with them. I'm going to see them coming. We who are alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds. So there's going to be clouds that day. <laughs> to meet the Lord in the air. That's Jesus. Jesus. And we will be with the Lord forever. Now, right then, I believe that's the final judgment. He will separate sheep from goats. We'll get a new physical body. New earth. We're going to have bodies like Jesus. And I'm going to talk about that in part two. About the judgment part. But I'm not going over that today. This is not saying everybody's saved. And I'm going to talk about that in part two as well. Everybody's not saved. Everybody will not be caught up with the loved ones. <laughs> But it's, it's an all or nothing event that happens right then. The only way you could come up with something else at that point is if you proof text. Okay, let's go on to number three. The third lie about the rapture. The tribulation years will begin after the rapture or before the rapture. So, more proof texting. The body of Christ believes that there is an event or a time period called the tribulation. How? Proof texting, man-made traditional error, not because of what's in the Bible. And they need, they need this. They need this particular epoch. They need this particular time period. That way, they can shove this all together and create this rapture theology. But here's the thing. When you go to the Bible, and please do this, don't proof text one verse. Don't proof text another verse. When you see that word tribulation, back up, read all around it. It is never describing a time period. The word tribulation is never capitalized. It's never an event. It is never a period of time that you are either in right now or enduring later. Ever. I know this is hard because when I first studied this for myself, I'm like, well, okay. So there is no post. There is no pre. There is no mid. Post, mid, pre. Pre, mid, post. So often, oh, you're a preterist, Macmillan. Oh, you're this, Macmillan. No, I'm not, because the, tr the word tribulation never describes a particular time period. 
don't just get mad at me. <laughs> I understand how cognitive dissonance works. You hear something, but you are dead set on what you already believe. You might have even written books about it. You might have posted stuff on social media about it. You might have taught on it. But you know what? There are things where I have learned and I'm like, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> I got to go back and change that or I got to stop saying that. Why? Because it is blatantly clear according to scripture that tribulation is never an event. Why do we need to know a particular event? Also, the, is it Eastern Standard or Central Time? <laughs> Mountain? What, do you see it? And this is how I also know. Because Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the days and times you don't need to know. So why would I need to be obsessed over a time period called a tribulation? I don't. And also, when I study the scriptures, every single time the word tribulation is used, it is describing trouble and suffering. Sometimes that trouble and suffering is great. Okay, let's go on to number four, the fourth lie about the rapture. Daniel prophesied about the rapture and Jacob's trouble from Jeremiah 30 is also referring to the rapture. Again, you could only come up with this if you proof texted. So let's talk about Daniel and his prophecies and let's talk about Jeremiah and what Jeremiah said. But before we do that, we need to go over into the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 says this. Now get this. In the past, God spoke through the prophets. Now that Christ has come, he speaks through his son. So Daniel is an Old Testament prophet. Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet. We respect them. We love them. Everything that they said is true. Everything they wrote belongs in the canon. But you have to read all of it from this side of the cross back. If you don't, you will be watching the movie The Sixth Sense, ignoring the fact that Bruce Willis is dead the entire time. You already know the end. Bruce Willis is dead, therefore, I am going to watch this entire movie differently. All of the interactions, everything that was said, how people are talking to him, how Haley Joel Osment is talking to him. Why? Because I know the end. So if we go back and we reread Daniel, we know what happened with Christ. Everything Daniel's talking about was fulfilled in Christ. He is referring to the new covenant. But we ignore that. We proof text. Please, and I do not have time to go over everything in Daniel and Jeremiah, and I'm not doing it. Read it for yourself. Everything that Daniel was talking about was fulfilled at the cross. The new covenant. A replacement of the old covenant. It is weak and useless and obsolete. Hebrews chapter 8 says that. Why? Because it could not make anyone perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's the people's inability to live up to their end of the bargain. We will do everything in the book of the law, Lord, they said. Okay, if you do this, I will bless you with great health and wealth. They were breaking the first commandment before the ink had even dried. They rebelled against the 613 commandments. This is why they were all in exile. And there's a new covenant coming that's better. Which brings me on to Jacob's trouble. Many people say, oh, Jacob's trouble. This is proof that there's a rapture. It's not. It has nothing to do with a rapture. Jeremiah chapter 30. Again, not written in chapters. But when Jeremiah wrote this, what's he talking about? The trouble of Israel. Another name for Jacob is Israel. 
Jacob was renamed Israel after wrestling with God in Genesis chapter 32. What's the trouble? Well, you see what the trouble is. Look at the Old Testament. Look at the Gospels. Their trouble was they were not following the law perfectly, which was required, and nobody could. So from the beginning, that was fading because it was weak and useless. Its glory was fading. But the new covenant came in through Jesus. Grace and truth. Not the law. Jacob is talking about Israel's inability to do what was required. But we, we want to take parts of Israel's law and say, give it your best shot. We got to have these on our courthouse square in our schools. But they never chucked it up. Do it all or do none of it. James 2, Galatians 3, all or nothing proposition. It's not about a rapture. Daniel was prophesying not about a rapture, but about the new covenant which would come through Christ. Jacob's trouble was Israel's trouble because they were not obeying the commandments in the law. Has nothing about, no, nothing to do with anything about a rapture. You would have to prove text. <laughs> the word rapture is not there. The connotation of rapture is not in the book of Jeremiah. The connotation is not in the book of Daniel. You would have to take all of this stuff from over here, shove it in there. Build a doctrine, gaslight people, or make people afraid. Ignoring everything that happened at the cross. Ignoring everything that happened with Israel. The dividing wall of hostility being torn. So now there is neither Jew nor Greek. We are all the new creation in Christ. Okay, let's go on to... Sorry if I'm intense, guys. <laughs> Um, normally when I do a walk talk type of series, like I've been doing, I, I pay very close attention to the feedback. And when I pay very close attention to the feedback and I study even harder, it's even more clear how blind the body of Christ is to what Christ has actually accomplished because of end times fear. And all of these passages in the Bible. Yeah, yes, that's in the Bible. But that is, that is proof texting out of context. You're not reading that how it's supposed to be read. You're reading it based on the interpretation of this man. Who is ignoring everything that Christ has done. Alright, let's go on to number five. This is going to be the last one. And then I'll go over the next five next week. The fifth lie about the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is clear. There is a rapture. Okay, so the word rapture is not there. The connotation of a rapture is not there. This entire chapter is Paul encouraging the Corinthians about their relatives who have already died. It's the same thing that he does over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. They've fallen asleep. He even says, if Christ has not been resurrected, our faith is useless. So he's saying, we would be the worst people, <laughs> the most pitied to be, uh, the most pitiable people on planet earth had Christ not rose from the dead. But Christ did rise from the dead. He came back from the dead. Therefore, your relatives who have already fallen asleep, who have already died. And when they return... We will be transformed. We'll get a new body. Just like Jesus. Jesus got a new physical body. We're going to get a new physical body in the twinkling of an eye. Our body is not going to be infected with this force of sin. We never have to worry about it dying again. We're going to be able to do the cool stuff Jesus did. <laughs> Could float. You know, we see him floating in Acts chapter 1. We see him popping in and out of air and stuff. Coming through walls. Still eating. 
still hanging out, still loving people. So this has nothing to do with the rapture. It has to do with Paul encouraging the Corinthians that Jesus did come back from the dead. Therefore, your loved ones who have already fallen asleep, they are already with him when he comes back. Not everybody is going to die. Not all will fall asleep. There will be a generation who never experiences a physical death. Because of the return of Jesus. And this is what he's talking about. He doesn't know if it's then. He doesn't know if it's then or then or then or then. He just knows it's going to happen. And when it happens, it's going to be great. That's it. Nothing about a rapture. You don't need to be afraid of this. This is no secret event. If, if a rapture was a secret event where the well-behaved Christians... <laughs> got taken up, what would be the point of life at that point? Grace would end. Good luck. There's no point in it whatsoever. It's a big fat lie. It is, it is a way to try to manipulate you and control you to have better behavior like the people who think they have good enough behavior to be raptured. And what's interesting is you will find that those who believe in this event, they will pressure you to behave like them. But here's the thing, just one sin, they wouldn't get to be raptured if there was an actual event of a rapture. Because that's not good enough. God requires perfection. You know, people say nobody's perfect. Well, that's true in your actions and attitudes, but not in your identity. Hebrews chapter 10 says, by one offering, you have been made perfect. What's the offering? The blood of Jesus. So you have nothing to fear. You are perfect. I'm not talking about what you do. We all do things that are not perfect. We all say things that are not perfect. But you have to separate your who from your do. Because the things that you do would require another death by Jesus. And it's not happening. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died. You have been made perfect forever. Jesus even said to the people who thought they were being perfect. In Matthew 5, 48, be perfect like your heavenly father. And they wanted to kill him for it because they sinned less than others. Air quotes. Just give it time. Because if you think that you are going to be raptured and you're doing something, there is going to be a moment in your life where you question your own salvation because you said and you did something that is very bad. But if you know that you're already perfect because what Christ has done, you can simply acknowledge that very bad thing and you can repent from it. You can turn from it. You can acknowledge it. You can confess it because you know that's not who I am. That's something that I did. That's something that I said. It's not who I am. You don't confuse the two. So this is the good news of the gospel, that you're a new creation, that you don't want to sin, that you want to express love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You don't want to keep any records of anyone's wrong. You do not want to delight in evil. You do not want to do anything that opposes your nature. But you will because you're still a human and the power of sin is still here. The force. But one day... You're going to get a brand new physical body. If you're still alive, you're going to be caught up in the clouds with your loved ones to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be amazing. So there's the five, the first five. Be sure to join me for the next five, the next five lies about the rapture on my next walk talk. I'm going to go over everybody being saved. I'm going to be going over Judgment Day, Great White Throne, some other things, just to give you a little teaser. All right, guys. So I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope it's brought to light some truth and some error. And you should always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. 
there's nothing wrong with you and you are awesome so always tell the truth about yourself always be yourself love y'all bye